So now we're ready to discuss sexual selection. First, let's look at it from the point of view of males. And because males can enhance their reproduction by gaining access to more and more females, they compete with each other for mating opportunities. And the most obvious way they do this is through direct combat. You may have seen these sorts of things on television where you've got male gazelle, wildebeest, lions, and giraffe all fighting for opportunities to mate with females. After they have access to the female herself, competition still continues through what's called sperm competition. The female may have already mated with another male. The new male that comes in now adds his sperm to the mix. But some species, like damselflies, have special physiological equipment that allows them to outcompete previous males. So the male damselfly has a penile scoop that he inserts into the female's reproductive tract to remove any competitor's sperm before he actually deposits his own sperm. And this is quite an extraordinary diversity. You've got a lot of different species of damselflies, and each one has its own unique scoop that matches the interior physiology of the female's reproductive tract, so it can be so efficient at removing any competitor's sperm. So when we look at damselflies on a nice spring day, it may seem, oh, look, they're mating. Isn't that sweet? They're so uh, attentive and kind to each other. Well, in fact, the first thing that's happening is the male is making sure that if she's mated with anybody else before he got there, that her, sper that her reproductive tract has been cleared of any competing sperm. Now, sperm competition can also happen just by sheer force of numbers. And this is seen in studies of primates, that is, the monkeys and the apes. And what's of interest here is the relative testes size. And that turns out to be largest in primates where females mate with multiple males. So here we have species of primates ranging from those that weigh about 200 kilograms down to really some pretty tiny monkeys. And what we have here is the size of the testes in each species versus their body weight. And so what we see is that for a given body weight, some species have quite large testes, and others have relatively small testes for that same size. And it turns out that this is the result of the mating system. All of these that are a solid black circle, you have multiple males in the same social group, and several different males may mate with the same female during her receptive period. Where we have just a single male in the social group, he's pretty much assured of paternity. He'll be the only male mating with that female during her fertile period. And so his testes are smaller for his body size than are those in these multiple male groups. Likewise, in monogamous species, their testes are pretty small for their body size. So there won't be much sperm competition and testes size is relatively small. Now, in these kinds of studies, people are often interested about human behavior. And we're a little bit below the average um, but we have slightly lar larger testes than some other species of our size. Now, comparing us with chimpanzees, chimps are really, really promiscuous. So these live in these multi-male groups, and a female chimp may mate on average with about eight different males each cycle, whereas women typically mate with only one and maybe a quarter men on average per cycle. So in chimpanzees, there's a lot of males putting their sperm inside the female tract, and so each male is trying to put the largest quantity of sperm as possible inside. So we have this more promiscuous species, the chimpanzee, and their testes are four and a half times larger for their body size than those are humans. And these larger testes, not only are larger, but they're producing far more sperm to inject into the female reproductive tract. Now, not only do they have larger sperm, sorry, not only do they have larger testes, but chimpanzee sperm swims faster because they're all in that race to get up to the uh, ova and be the one to conceive the child. And so this is a study of the swimming speeds of sperm of chimpanzees, so highly promiscuous. This is a macaque. It's a kind of monkey, which is right up here. It's also multiple male. Here's human sperm here. It has a lower speed. And gorillas are pretty slow indeed. Gorillas are large, but they have a one male group, and so there's not much sperm competition. 
So in these two species that do have a high degree of sperm competition because multiple males mate with the same female during her receptive period, the velocity of their sperm is quite considerably higher. Even though human females are less promiscuous than chimpanzees, they are slightly promiscuous. And human males show adaptations to sperm competition. One of the leading scientists in this area is a man named Gordon Gallup in New York. And he has argued that there are various aspects of human mating behavior and physiology that show signs of these sorts of adaptations. First is the duration of copulation. And the second is the shape of the male penis itself where the gland at the tip removes sperm deposited by prior males. He actually has developed a number of models of male reproductive genitalia and had them inserted inside plastic female genitalia, inserted first in here with some Elmer's glue, and then seen whether these different shapes are better or worse at removing any fluid that might already be in the female tract. And when he puts these different shapes and sizes, those that don't have that gland at the tip, the glands at the tip, are not as successful at removing any sperm that might have already been present if the woman had mated with somebody else recently. He also found that if the woman of a pair has been giving any indications of infidelity, that is, she might have been mating with somebody else, the man says, that yes, when I mate with her, then he's more likely to thrust deeper, and he's also going to thrust more quickly. Both of these are behaviors that be more likely to inject the competitor's sperm. The female reports the same thing, that if her husband suspects her, then her husband then does go in deeper and faster. So these are ways, then, that the male is responding to the threat to his paternity of her eventual offspring. Now, the male phallus is reached some sort of amazing limit with this animal. This is the Argentine lake duck. It's not much different than a normal duck we would have around here, but it has this extraordinary phallus, much longer than its own body length. This has been described in rather remarkable detail here as the base is covered with spines, yet the tip is soft and brush-like. Drakes probably use their penises like bottle brushes to remove sperm stored in the oviduct. The larger the bottle brush, the more effective it will be for the drake to father the ducklings. So the actual shape of his penis is such that he can remove any other sperm that might already be in the female tract. Now, this particular study was published in a very prominent scientific magazine, and it's almost, they, they almost ended this uh, article with a joke. They say that many questions remain unanswered. How much does the drake actually insert? And does the anatomy of the female make her unusually difficult to inseminate? The Argentine lake duck offers a sizable opportunity to study sexual selection. So that's post-mating competition through sperm competition. But even after the baby is conceived and born, there's one more other form of competition between males. And this is called post-conception competition. And this is typified in this clip of lions. This is a male lion that's just taken over a new social group. The thing to know about lions here is that the females breed rather slowly. Once they have babies, they're not going to breed again for nearly two years. So each of their offspring takes a long, long time to reproduce. And a new male coming into a pride like this one may only have a short time to breed. So rather than waiting, for those babies to grow up so that he can then wait with the mother and mate with her when she resumes her receptivity, male lions systematically kill infants when they first take over a pride. They don't eat them, they're just killing them. The point of this is to stop the female from investing in her current offspring and replacing the stepchildren with their own. This is one of the most difficult things to watch. It's one of the most difficult things that I've ever seen in nature. But it's very common, and every male lion, whenever he takes over a pride and finds new babies in that pride that belong to the previous males, he behaves exactly like this and kills them. So these are males that are in a hurry. They have a relatively short time in order to get their own genes in the next generation, so they cannot afford to waste their time being stepfathers. Let me just give you a brief outline of how the lion's social system works. 
you have a group of females that form the core of what's called a pride. A group of males come in from somewhere else and then they make babies. The babies take two years to reach a point uh, where the males may then disperse, go off to take over another pride somewhere else. And at two years old, then the daughters may go off and form a new pride or be recruited into their mother's pride. But that whole process takes about two years. If we have a family with the males and the mothers and the babies, and you have a new set of males that come in and kill those cubs, they're simply going to replace those stepchildren with their own, and the whole process now repeats it, except it's with their offspring rather than somebody else's. And so they're replacing their stepchildren with their own offspring. Infanticide is a tactic that speeds up the male's own reproductive success. His new females are going to invest solely in their current offspring for those first two years of their life. And so if the male first enters the pride when the cubs are, say, about a few months old, then he would have to wait 18 months before he could breed with those females. But if he kills the cubs right away, he can breed with them, and then he has his own offspring in the pride a whole year quicker. And for a lion who may only have two years of breeding opportunities his whole life, that's a critical advantage. Now, this kind of sexually selected infanticide is not just found in lions. It's not a quirk of lions. It's wherever you find very intense male-male competition with limited opportunities to mate with the females, but these are females that to spend a very long time looking after their offspring, so they're very long inner birth intervals. So this is observed in lots of different cats. Besides the lions, it's been seen in leopards, tigers, cougars, bobcats, even house cats are infanticidal. It's also seen in a lot of different species in rodents. It's seen in numerous different monkeys and apes, and even in zebras, horses, and hippos. Zebras will come in and kick to death any foals they find in the new family. So, we've seen that males compete with each other before, during, and after mating. The most important thing for the male is to gain access to the females in whatever way they can.